Matthew chapter 6. If you haven't been here for a while, I'm going to catch you up really quickly, lightning fast. Here you go. We're in Matthew. We're in a place called the Beatitudes or the Blessings. Jesus has been showing during this sermon he's giving, he's showing the heart of what Israel, God's nation, was meant to preserve among the nations of the world. There were things that Israel was supposed to preserve like salt for the nations of the world, and Jesus is getting back to the heart of those things, such as the character of God. Who has met somebody who had a really skewed version of God? The character of God was so messed up, they didn't get it. Yeah, I see some hands back there like, yes, I know that person real well. Yeah, I think all of us have met somebody who didn't see God properly. So the character of God is important for somebody to either receive or reject God on proper grounds, to really know who is God. Israel was supposed to preserve the nature and the character of God properly so people could see him accurately, as well as the heart behind the Ten Commandments or the Ten Words, to make sure that they're not just words, that there's actually a heart behind it. Israel, and more importantly, Israel's teachers, they had done poorly with this, but Jesus, and now he's up on a mountainside, and he's invited people up the mountain with him to put things back into proper perspective. He talks a lot about salt and light. Matthew 6, and we're going to be right at verse 1. We're only going to read verse 1 for a second here. Verse 1. Here's what he says. Be careful, this is the words of Jesus, right? Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you'll have no reward from your Father in heaven. Let's just start with that verse because I want to make sure that somebody doesn't get sucked into taking that one verse out of context and misunderstanding what Jesus is saying. I want to point out that there are dozens of New Testament verses that tell us that when we do good things or good works in front of unbelievers, like just naturally when we're living our good Christian life, it encourages them to see past us and see God working through us or in us. There are dozens of verses that encourage that. Unbelievers will then glorify God when they see the genuine goodness of God active in us. This passage from today in Matthew 6, 1, the passage is not saying that you should hide every good thing that you do. It's not what it's teaching. That's not the heart behind this. Like, oh, I want to do something good, but people will see it, so I better not do it. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense, right? That's illogical. It's talking specifically about motivations, okay? In that passage, it says, don't practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. Have you ever met somebody who is goody two-shoes on cloud nine? Man, they just love to be seen being righteous. Look how good I am. I remember back in the day, you know, we used to pass offering around. And I remember seeing somebody who, like, did one of these kind of things. You know, it's like, could you bring your arm any higher for anybody to see the money going in the offering? <laughs> Kind of wonder about their motivations, about uh, what are you trying to do here? And you, you've probably seen that before, and it just really sets you off. It's weird when somebody's motivations are not to worship God, but it's to be seen by others. Jesus is speaking specifically to that. You don't do good things to be seen as a goody two-shoes, but you must display the good works in your life so that people will see you are aligned with God, who is not selfish. Good works, good works in Christ are God works, and they're inherently unselfish, and they're extra work, by the way. That's all he's saying. Okay, Matthew 6, go to verse 2. Verse 2, and here's what it says. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. I'm just going to tell you, I've tried that on my wife, and she didn't believe me for a second. I, did, I mean, the credit card was my right hand. My left hand was like, don't do it. But you guys know what he's saying with that, that you're not doing it for other people to see. Verse 4, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father who sees what's done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogue and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go to your room, close the door, and pray to your Father 
who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what's done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep babbling like the pagans, for they think they'll be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This, then, is how you should pray. Notice it says, this, then, is how you should pray. It doesn't say, this, then, is what you should pray. There's kind of a nuance. There's a difference here. Here's how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Here's the important part. This always gets separated from the prayer. Here's Jesus explaining something from the prayer. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Jesus, how dare you say something? I mean, really? Really? That's bold, isn't it? Bold. Jesus knew about bold in 2022, 2,000 years ago, when he was bold in everything he said. He also means what he says here. We know that Jesus uses hyperbole, like gouge out the eye, cut off the hand. But he means what he says. The essence of what he's teaching about forgiveness goes to a deeper place in us, a deeper understanding of how humanity works. You know, one of the things, I was just talking to a friend about this last night. One of the things I enjoy about this, this whole passage, the Beatitudes, is the way that we function is we look at other people and sometimes we, we try to pick the, the speck out of their eye kind of thing, right? Where we're picking people apart. We're pointing a finger about their life. We try to get vengeance sometimes. You know, an eye for an eye, the Old Testament, Old Testament misunderstanding. An eye for an eye. And then Jesus comes along and instead of somebody else's eye, He says, if your eye causes you to sin, gouge your own eye out. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Jesus has so reversed the image of right doing that you should be looking at yourself first before you even look at anybody else. Jesus has really preached an astonishing sermon to people when he says things like this, if if you forgive other people, then you'll be forgiven. This is catching people's attention. By the way, this is unpopular doctrine, isn't it? (laughs) This is unpopular doctrine. Again here, folks, um, in in a prayer, the focus on prayer is not to discourage you from praying in front of other people. That would be ridiculous. And and, and I I know that that could be confusing for some people. Uh, But remember, the apostles, even the apostles, prayed and proclaimed healing publicly with people. The goal is not to hide every spiritual element of you. Quite the opposite, actually. The goal, however, is to consider the motivations and the intentions behind the actions. Why are you doing what you're doing? That's the whole point of this passage. Jesus wants to clue people in that if you're doing it for other people, you might as well do it in secret so that it can be for God. That's why. And so it's not to, to like try to make you hide every good work or every action that serves God. I, I had a friend once tell me, hey, when we're going to do the little prayer circle thing, we had this little group, and he said, we're going to do this prayer circle thing, don't call on me. And I was like, you know that makes me want to do the exact opposite. I, now I so badly want to call on you. Uh, can you tell me why? Like, what's going on? Just tell me. It's, it's cool, but tell me. And they're like, well, I, I don't believe in praying in front of other people. And I tried not, have you guys ever seen Ace Ventura? It's fine if you haven't. It's probably better. <laughs> but he's got this eyebrow thing that he can do. Like, let me see your Ace Ventura eyebrow do it right now. Look at me. You know, he does this thing, and he like, that's pretty good. That's pretty good, Jen. I like that. He like lifts his eyebrow way, way up here. Jim Carrey's face is just made of rubber, you know. When the person told me, like, well, I don't, I don't believe in praying in front of other people, my eyebrow, I was like, just settle down, settle down, because it wanted to go way up here, like, what? are you talking about? Like, that's a convenient belief that you have established, but you didn't get it from here. It didn't come from here. I think it came from a misunderstanding, but it didn't come from here. You know, the Bible encourages us to become comfortable praying together, and occasionally in front of unbelievers too, occasionally. Kind of depends why you're doing it. Matthew 18, 19 says, Again, I say to you, if, if, if you agree on earth about anything... 
that you ask. If two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for them by the Father in heaven. And that's, that's, a, that's a, a scripture about prayer. Two people agreeing, say amen together. James 5.16, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. James 5.14, Is anyone sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Acts 12.12 12 describes, again, people getting together in prayer. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose name was also Mark, where many were gathered together praying. Okay, so this whole idea of prayer being just a private thing is a bad idea. Do you guys recognize that? This idea that I only pray when I'm not around other people and it's just in the prayer closet, that's a bad idea. And unfortunately, I think it's a very accepted idea in the world. Like, well, we don't pray together. We don't pray in front of each other. I had somebody once tell me, I'm going to leave the church because I don't believe in people praying in front of each other. So you've had people lift their voices like at the end of service. I've let some of you guys just pray out. They say, I'm going to leave the church over it. And I, I, in a way, in a soft way, I was kind of like, I think that's a point I'm going to keep. <laughs> I don't think we're going to give that one up. Some people are so convinced that we should not be praying in front of each other. And I feel bad for them because they're missing out on a key relational thing that God has given us. Some people think that prayer is for God, that God's like, oh, I just wish somebody would call me. Oh, man, like I got this phone and it's never talked to me. It's for you. God gave us prayer and this communication because it's good for you. And he knows that we need to be united together. And so sometimes you'll have private prayer, but a lot of times praying with other people is a blessing for you. It unites you two together to really put some steam out and call on the God of heaven together. Who knows that two horses pull more than one horse? So you get them together and they can do incredible things. And so God knows that about us. Prayer is for you. And obviously prayer has a relationship attribute and an aspect between us and God. It's important. It's communication. But God knows you need this. The scripture says he knows what you need before you even ask him. That should be a little hint to us that prayer is really for you. Amen. And it's for you to do with other believers. Private prayer is important. It is. But it's important that we pray privately so we're prepared to pray with other people, sometimes in a sort of public setting. Like, this is kind of a public setting, I guess. It's important that we have private prayer time, that you are talking to the Lord on your own time so that you can deal with some of the selfish things, the individualistic things. So when you come together with other people, you can be other people focused. You can think about their needs and how you ought to be praying for them. It's really important. All right, let's move on. So the Lord's rebuke in this passage is it's clearly about motivations, not actually praying publicly or with other people. Um, I mentioned it in there. It says this is how you should pray. The Lord's prayer is a template of how to pray. But if your prayer never goes beyond the template, if you're just reciting the template, that sounds kind of funny. Let me put it in another thing. Like if you work in maybe a modern job and, and your boss gives you a template to fill out, and it says, insert name here. And if you wrote down, insert name here, in that spot, your boss would be like, I don't know why we hired you. <laughs> this is, you should know better. Okay, so when we read this, this is a template of a prayer. Jesus is showing you this is what it could look like, and these are the core factors, but you make it personal. You fill it out with your information, and you glorify God. Like, when was the last time you woke up? And maybe some of you do, but I, I think a lot of us don't speak this way. You woke up, and you're like, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Oh, good morning, Preston, good morning. Hallowed be thy name. You know, we don't even talk like that. There's language in there. You don't talk like that. So why would you just copy a form prayer that's listed in there? Why would you just copy the words? I know, I, here's the thing, here's my theory. I think people feel extra spiritual, especially if they can quote it in the KJV. They feel extra spiritual. If I can speak some 18th century English, God will really hear me good. Okay, I mean, you could say it in Hebrew and it wouldn't do any better than anything else. It's just, God wants you to fill these things out. He wants it to be personal. And, and my father preached a great message a while back explaining that personalization of prayer and worship. Um, it's ironic in this passage that we have entire denominations that the only prayer they ever teach their church is, is like the form prayer. 
just, just the words that are already recited. And there's nothing personal to it. And I, I get concerned about that because Jesus just said, don't be like the pagans who think they're going to be heard because there are many words. They're reciting form prayers. That's what pagans did. They would recite form prayers and repeat the same thing, mantras, over and over and over. And Jesus says, don't do that. Make it something real, something personal about you. But he gives us good content and a good focus for how our prayer should go about. And so there's praise in there. That makes a lot of sense. There's praise. There's recognition of God's will over everything you're going to pray. Okay? You're not God. You don't stand in his place either. And so we pray, your will be done. But we find a way. God, I, I really need this raise, but you know what? If you don't need me to have a raise, your will be done. It's what you want. That's an example of personalizing it, okay? Give us this day our daily bread, you know, the things that we need. Forgive us our debts as we forgive debtors, forgiving people in our life. That's got to be very personal. You can't just say those words. You probably need to put in a name. Somebody has wronged you. It's probably not good enough to say, well, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. You need to put that name in that prayer. Like, Lord, you know what Charlie did. Oh, nobody likes that guy right now. Forgive me as I forgive him. You've got to make it personal. Lead us not in temptation. Each of us is tempted differently. There are things that tempt you differently than the people around you, and you need to personalize, Lord, this is what's really coming after me right now. This is the temptation. Don't allow me to be led into this temptation, this specific area, this trap I keep falling into. Don't let that be. Deliver us from the evil one. And of course, he closes with that famous line, God freely forgives you, but if you deny others God's grace and forgiveness, then you're denying God's grace and forgiveness for your own life too. That's a scary thought. It's really denying the work of the Holy Spirit. That's why Jesus takes it so seriously. That when you won't forgive other people, you are in effect denying the work and the grace of the Holy Spirit on your life. And so Jesus is saying, you become a denier of me when you won't extend forgiveness to other people because the whole message of the cross is forgiveness. I think a lot of people want to skip past this very conveniently and, and not take too much time. Jesus ends this particular teaching with that passage. I think the point of the prayer, I think the point of this whole section about prayer is to get to the point where you're at a right relationship with people so you can stay in a right relationship with God and not enter back into sin. Does that make sense, church? Let's go to Matthew 6 and go to verse 16. You guys doing good? Amen. Woo! Come on, somebody. Amen. Get hyped. All right, there we go. I just, one or two sleepers just got to get you up, you know. Go to verse 16. Here's what it says. Fasting. When you fast, do not look somber as the, the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show that they're fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you're fasting, but only to your heavenly Father who is unseen. And your, your Father who, is, who sees what is done in secret, he will reward you. Just a, a quick comment on that. It just makes me laugh. I remember in high school, specifically talking about fasting, there was a church in town that would have a regular and annual fast together. I think it's a great idea, by the way. I think it's a wonderful thing. I, I think I should do a better job of encouraging fasting in our congregation. It's not something that we should you know, relegate to the past, really. I, I personally fast from time to time, and you could fast different things. It doesn't have to be just food. But food was a really big deal back in the day. Okay, it's like an iPhone. You guys know what that is? It's a really important... Um, so they would fast these things, and people in culture back in the day, they would disfigure their faces like they would walk around like, oh, oh, oh life is so hard, I'm so hungry, Neil, I'm so hungry. This church in town, all the kids would come from the church to the school that day, and I kid you not, they would walk into school, and if they could have like covered themselves in sackcloth and ashes, they would have done that too. They were walking like, oh, 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 in gym class, it's time to run laps. And I remember a kid saying, sorry, coach, I can't run very good. I'm fasting <laughs> for the Lord, you know. Just can't do it. Like, I wanted to ask this one kid, is there anybody who doesn't know that you're fasting right now? I think you've told everybody. The math teacher didn't need to know that you were fasting. There's nothing, you know, it's just this thing where it's like, everybody look at me. So in the old days, the Pharisees and Sadducees are doing stuff like that. Look at me, look at me, look at me, look how much I suffer for God. I'm so righteous and so holy. 
And fasting was a big deal in their culture. Getting God's attention, showing your devoutness. It was, it was a way of doing that. And Jesus is saying, if you're going to fast, man, don't let people see that. You should look your best. You look your best. You don't do it for their eyes. You do it for the God who is unseen. And he'll see you and the things you're doing in secret, and he's going to honor you because it's real. The motivation is alive on the inside. You're not doing it for public praise. It's so good, isn't it? Go to verse 19. Verse 19, here's what it says. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is there your heart will be also. Oh, God, I wish you didn't know us so well. Man, you know us really well. It's so true. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. If your eyes are, are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness. No one can serve two masters. Either you will you will hate one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Let's just pause there for a second. Some people think that Jesus just skipped a beat and got disconnected there. Because he, he kind of talks about like treasures stored up, and then he talks about the darkness inside of us, and then he talks about money again. He's not skipping a beat. He's making a sandwich. He's compacting an idea and a danger of a love for other things. He's compacting it there. Jesus is helping you realize that a person who's lusting after stuff and storing things up for themselves, kind of like hoarding stuff up for themselves, if they have no generosity, if they have no goodness of generosity, that person is full of darkness because they can't serve God and their love of stuff simultaneously. You can't serve God and money, he says, and he's so right. You know, we have a a giving box in the back. If you're curious about that, you can give online. We have a little giving box back there. And uh, and I've always said that regular, faithful giving, not giving God leftovers, but regular, faithful giving is cheap insurance that will protect you from loving money and stuff more than God. This command to be generous and give is a protection for you. God isn't in heaven like, man, daddy needs a new car. Oh, man, I need, a, I need a new crib. I need something nice. God doesn't need your money. He needs your heart. And unfortunately, money has a way of really worming its way into your heart. And so God is smart. He knows us really well. And he says, I'm going to extract that love of stuff and money. I'm going to pull that out a little bit. And so I think when he tells us to be generous in the New Testament and to give freely and sacrificially to the church and the mission of the church, I think he knows this is good for you. It's actually going to bless you. It's going to make you a non-detestable person. Have you ever met somebody greedy that you liked? Now, unfortunately, Eric has a saying. Have you ever seen somebody on a jet jet ski who's not smiling? And uh, (laughs) my answer is no. (laughs) But I'll be honest with you. Uh, Greed in the New Testament is called idolatry. You need to understand that greed is associated with worshiping a false god. It is that serious. Greed is idolatry. So Jesus has made a sandwich to help us understand the nature of the kingdom of God, that you can't serve your love of stuff and money and serve God because they're going different directions. It's going to take you to different places. You need to count the cost, add it up, and choose today whom you will serve. That's what you need to do. For me and my house, we have served the Lord. We're going to serve the Lord. So the generosity we practice, it it keeps us in tune with the nature of God and and the urgency of the kingdom of God. That's what giving does. It keeps us in tune with the urgency of the mission that we have. And by the way, God is not against you being rich. I like to throw this in there because I think it's an important balance on this. God is not against you being rich. But if, you are, uh, if you're given a lot, God does require a lot. He expects a lot. That is just a principle found in the scripture. Okay? So God's not against you being rich. In fact, you should glorify God if you're doing well. You should be happy about that. I think intelligent people make wise financial decisions. You shouldn't be like looked down on because of that. But we're going to be honest. Jesus has a lot to say about the person who's rich and not generous. 
That's where the danger ends up being. Some of the greater Christians that I know are rich, they're business owners, they do very, very well, and I just can't believe how much they're giving and taking care of people constantly. I'm like, man, I see the Holy Spirit moving on you all the time. You're so generous, and God gives them more. I think that's what it is. I think God gives them more. I want all of you, by the way, to do well. I really do. I want you to do well. I want you to have enough, at the very least, to meet your needs so you can praise God and give to other people. Matthew 6, 25. Therefore, I urge you, do not worry about your life and what you'll eat or drink or about your body or what you'll wear. See, I've never worried about that. Um, it, is, it is not life more than food and the body more than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about your clothes? It's a great question. Why do you worry about your clothes? See how the flowers of the field, they do not labor or spin. And yet I tell you that not even Solomon on all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow was thrown into the fire, Will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows. He knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough troubles of its own. Man, is Jesus relatable right there. Preach Jesus. You know. You know what it's about. I think it's appropriate that we end here, and, and I think it's appropriate that chapter 6 ends here. Jesus saying, don't worry. And it got me thinking, actually, what is the root behind worrying? It's lack of trust. That's the root of worrying. It's lack of trust. And see, that's dangerous. Because you're going to trust something. You'll trust in yourself. You'll trust in other people. Trust in the economy. Trust in your spouse. All these things break, and they get it wrong. And it doesn't solve the worry problem. Jesus is saying, replace that. You can't have, and it's a famous saying, but you can't have worship and worry in your mouth at the same time. You can't. Isn't that true? You can't have worship and worry in your mouth. You can't doubt God and proclaim all your woes at the same time as worshiping him. It doesn't fit together well. And we need to trust God in these things. And, 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 and I want to point this out. With this statement of saying don't worry, Jesus isn't just saying don't worry. He's also telling us to trust God. It's the only way it's possible to not worry is to trust God. There has to be a solution. There has to be something to fill the void of worry. And it is trust. It's the only thing tall enough to fit. It's good for us to recognize that worry and trust cannot occupy the same place in us. So I'll tell you what, you know, you could, you could hold on to your worry, and, and people do, and I, I have too. I have failed this one. You can hold on to your worry. I'll tell you what happens when you do. You complexify things. When you worry about stuff, you make it more complex. Who can say amen to that? It's amazing how the mind, it's such an organ, I tell you what, your mind is so amazing. As, as a brain, you think about the thing you're worried about, and you just start adding more and more variables to it, and you took a bad situation, and you make it worse. <laughs> the vividness of your concern is just bright, and it's amazing how you can take a, a kind of unsure situation and add to it, and by 12.30 at night, when you should be sleeping, but you've been worrying You've been choosing to worry. Now that thing that was kind of scary is terrifying. That's what your worry can do to you. You know that people who are worried and stressed out and full of anxiety do not have a long life expectancy. That's a fact, church. That's a fact. It shortens your very life. It's bad for your health when you constantly live in this anxiety state of worry, not trusting God. God knows what's good for us. So we should trust God. We can remember who he is, that he created the universe with his very word. And he will have the last word when it's time to be done. We can keep him in the proper place of understanding who he is. You know, the disciples, speaking of the word, the disciples once got into a boat with Jesus, and I love this, I don't have time to preach the passage, 
But the disciples got into a boat with Jesus and a bad, bad storm came and Jesus was sleeping in the stern and Jesus isn't worried about the storm, which seems kind of unfair, Neil, if we're going to be honest. The guy who walks on water, he's not that concerned about it. You know, at best you got rock boy here, Peter. He can take a couple steps. He's not spiritually as buoyant as Jesus is. So the disciples are worried and that's what you, you do. A storm comes and you're worried and Jesus isn't worried. He's not worried. And you guys kind of know how the story goes, but I, I just want to read it in a second. Um, there's scary waves coming over the boat. Jesus is asleep, and the disciples, I, I imagine, they're fighting a storm. They're just trying to keep the thing from sinking. And one of them, I'm not pointing any fingers at all, Thomas. I'm not pointing any fingers. We don't know who it was. We have, we have no idea if it was Thomas, but if the shoe fits, you know. Somebody amongst that group of so spiritual people says, Teacher, don't you care about us? We're going to drown. Don't you care if we drown? Whoops. They didn't realize that class was in session, and they were the subjects of a lesson right there, right then. Their worry got the best of them in that moment when Jesus was right there. I think sometimes we artificially inflate, well, if I was with Jesus, I wouldn't have gotten scared I would have been so bold and so tough, and I never would have ran away. Yeah, the disciples thought that too. They're feet away from the Messiah, and a little storm comes. They're like, don't you care if we drown? And the man, the foot in the mouth situation, and here's how it goes. He got up, he rebuked the wind, and he said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Faith and trust are synonyms. Do you still not trust me? That's what Jesus was saying. He's three feet away from them. And you can laugh at that and say, well, man, those silly disciples, it's even worse for you and I. The Holy Spirit lives inside of us. He's not a foot away. He lives inside of you. Man is worry and doubt and fear a terrible thing to deal with. And when you empower that, you really offend the nature of the Holy Spirit inside of you who should give us boldness and authority. And I love this passage. Uh, it says, he said to the disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And they were terrified. Now they're terrified of him. <laughs> At first they're afraid of the wind and the waves. Now they're terrified of him. And they asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Now they put the proper respect there. Now they're like, oh, I shouldn't have been afraid of the wind and the waves. I should have been afraid of the one who, with his word, controls the situation. Here's where my respect is going to be. It's to you. If you're going to worry, if you're going to have a healthy fear, it's, it's of the living God. That's the right place to have it. So sure, church, you, you could if you wanted to, you can fail the lesson that God is giving us in this passage. You can worry if you want to, and your worries will drown you. They'll do it. Uh, I, I know it. I, I think there's some people who should be in the church with us right here today, but I think worry has drowned them. I get concerned about them. It's a real thing we deal with, isn't it? You could do that, or you could do what verse 33 or 34 says. Let's go back to that real quick. Verse 33 and 34. It says, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. I think that's the solution. I think that's the answer to worry is seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, and all these things, the things that you need, the things that would normally concern you, it'll be added to you. He's going to take care of you. Who agrees with that? Amen. You know, God does, and he will continue to take care of of his faithful ones. He does. He's very good at it. And uh, we're going to go into a time of communion. Worship team, if you want to come on up. Uh, we're going to go into a time of communion. And communion is an example of the time that the Lord gave himself to provide for us. That's what it is. Communion is, is the remembering of the time that God provided for his people. And so uh, I want to do something a little different. I'm actually going to ask... Uh, would...